Do American companies get China? Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Kitty Bu in Shanghai. China and the U.S. are important trading partners, but these two major countries, important markets in their own right, sometimes clash in their approach to doing business. This week on Thoughtful China, our experts Bob Thilin, Han Lin, and Sarah Coughlin will share their insights on whether or not American companies are getting China and how does it show on the market. And KPMG's David Frey will share a thought or two about the importance of truly understanding China for American companies. But first, with us today is Scott Williams, VP of Programs and Services at the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. Scott, welcome to our studio. Thank you. It's great to be here. First of all,、um, let me start by asking you: How do you define if a company gets China or not? I think there's different ways to define it. It's hard to take broad strokes, but but generally, if a company is hitting their one to three year plan, and in some companies it's, it's going to be a five year plan,、uh, if they're hitting their plan, and, and every year that first year as it revolves into the next fiscal year, they're going to adjust so they're on track to meet their three or five year plan. I think that's a good indicator. Another indicator is that we we survey our members every year, 1,800 companies, and representing most of the Fortune 500, and they're telling us how they're doing.、Um, and 75 percent are more profitable, and they're letting us know the areas of of challenge and the area of, of opportunity and where they want to be investing. And I think the third one is,、uh, what are what are Chinese consumers saying、uh, in the WeChat rooms,、uh, the different social rooms that most multinationals. Are investing in finding out what the consumer voice is. That third voice is a strong indicator of how they're doing. The China market is much fiercer than, say, most of the Western markets. Do you think business owners coming to China are prepared to deal with these conditions, and how do they pre- prepare? I think most business managers, when they look at China, they know it's a fast-growing market. That there's there, there's tremendous opportunity. There's growth, and the consumer buying power is growing all the time. Uh, th- so they look at China、uh, sometimes with different glasses, meaning that there's a bit more analysis and a bit more、uh, discernment beyond just the urban areas of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. So when they get into second and third tier cities, they're looking more into the cultural aspects that are unique in those locations. But generally,、uh, I think the the fierceness is is mostly the pace of change, and Chinese tend to be very opt- op- opportunistic. While Americans tend to be more process oriented, and I think American companies that are successful are getting better at faster process decision making and analytics to make the right decisions and, and start the right execution, and and this represents a, a tremendous opportunity. That discernment that goes into the major ur- urban areas and the, the more rural areas sometimes can differ, and I think that's a that's an exciting、uh, area. The other area that I think this is, is important is that as the China market is slowing down slightly, it's still higher growth than most markets in the world, and it's a very large market. And so the conversations between the, the head of the Chinese company here, the Chinese-run company here for the multinational or medium-sized business, that discussion back with the home office about what are you trying to derive out of the Chinese market, whether it's profitability or market share, is getting more complex. Uh, but I think American companies are on top of that and, and looking at ways to uh, to uh, garnish more uh, 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 profitability or market share out of the market. In terms of products and services, do you think companies understand how their products and services would fit into the Chinese economy and the needs of Chinese consumers? If so, could you share a couple of good examples of firms who've done well in this field? I think the,、uh, an easy example would be Apple. Apple's had a tremendous success in this market. I think in the last quarter of this last calendar year, it was ranked number one in terms of being the, the top brand in China. So there's a, certainly a fever for Apple products and. That's a unique mold where their global strategy and global product strategy, for the most part, is fairly consistent around the world.、Um, there's other good examples:、uh, General Motors and Ford.、Uh, Tory Burch has done well in that middle-range luxury market. You've seen Coach do fairly well, and then you've got a lot of s- substantial firms that are in the consumer market, like Coca-Cola, Mars, and others that have pretty pretty strong reach. So I think those are those are some. Some good examples that I think that Americans now are really up to speed on the fact that you can't take a typical model that's successful in the United States or Europe 
and simply plant it in the Chinese market and have it, have it run in the same, with the same level of success. So I think that discernment's getting better, the analysis is getting better, and the cultural aspects of what the Chinese consumer is looking for is certainly critical to be able to adapt to and, and, and connect with. What are the key areas, critical aspects of China for people to understand in order to fit better towards the Chinese need? You know, I, I come from a logistics background in, in Asia, both Japan and Taiwan and China, the mainland as well, and it's, it's been uh, about 20 years in logistics. So what we always talked about in logistics was the importance of infrastructure, supply chain, 3PL, delivery, and having a really good last mile. So the last cash on delivery and it's recorded, you can return goods, that's the last mile. But I think when an area that is really critical more and more in the last few years uh, is the first mile. And the first mile, I think, is changing all aspects of how companies should be looking at connecting with consumers. There's 600 million Alipay users in China, registered users. There are 12 million trips uh, abroad from China to the world, and, and the travel agencies are telling us this. In 2015, 12 million trips. By 2020, there'll be 20 million trips outside of of China. So the awareness is going for U.S. products. But the Chinese consumer is different. How they browse and how they browse for products and purchase products. Those 600 million users are purchasing a lot with a mobile phone online. They're using Alipay or, and that's just one example of convenient pay systems. So missing out on that opportunity to hook in on that first mile uh, in the most opportune, opportune way for American companies I think is something we need to continue to uh, keep focused on. And, and look at ways of connecting with that Chinese consumer after that purchase is then to, to watch what, what are the WeChat rooms and social media rooms saying that uh, tells, tells us how the uh, Chinese consumer is feeling about that product and based on that feedback, what are the new opportunities going forward? You've been in Asia 27 years, mm -hmm. so you've yeah. been a, an executive in Asia for 27 years, yes. so how important is it for a company to send a executive to China running the company's uh, operation here when this person already had some China experience from before? I think it's critically important. You need to have that ambassador from your home office that's coming into the market that is, is, is you know, carrying forward the important strategies from the home office. You also need to have that, that individual that can have the right, uh, the ability to uh, transfer the, the company culture from the U.S. into China. But also you need the executive that, that can hire uh, and sometimes fire executive or executives or senior manager or middle management people that can deliver on the strategy plan and the execution plan. There's a real battle for talent in, in China today. Uh, there are rare examples of uh, executives uh, and local executives that can take the company mission, can deliver on the company culture, and be able to take that and deliver that message down to all levels of the organization. So the battle, battle for talent is definitely there, and I think there's going to be uh, even more so uh, the, the opportunity for more uh, companies to develop people internally and, and not have to restart and, and bring in new executives. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Let's take a quick break, then we will hear from David Frey, partner of Market Strategy at KPMG. In my experience, many American companies do eventually get China, but it is rarely an easy or straightforward process. I think if you looked at successful foreign companies in China from any part of the world, you could develop a formula for building a really successful, sustainable business in China. That formula would involve, just like any place in the world, carving out a unique selling point to key customer segments and working backwards from customer needs to develop a solid customer value proposition. But what we advise companies that is different about this process in China is the need for developing a parallel value proposition to the government. Thinking about the government's economic and social development plans for the country, a province, or a city, and developing a government value proposition that runs in parallel to the customer value proposition. Foreign companies that do this successfully and ingrain it in their business culture in China typically gain great traction. I find that when we discuss this with Japanese or Korean companies, they understand it fairly intuitively. European companies get it next most easily. When we explain this to American company executives, especially those that have not operated in China before, they typically look at us like we are from another planet. It takes some persistence, creativity, 
and examples to explain this pervasive role and influence of the government to American companies. Certainly companies like Caterpillar, Honeywell, Johnson & Johnson, Ford, and even entertainment and consumer companies like Disney and KFC, all iconic names in American business, have understood this well over time in China and done well as a result. Thanks, David. We're back in our studio today with our panelists, Bob Thelin, President at China Vest, Han Lin, Senior Vice President at Wells Fargo in Shanghai, and Sarah Coughlin, former Managing Director of Innovation at Dragon Rouge. Welcome to our studio today. Um, Scott just mentioned that China market is quite fragmented and it requires a different approach perhaps to final success. I was um, wondering, is there any universal method of attempting to understand the market here? Essentially, I think people do market research, but I think more importantly these days is to do cultural research, um, trying to understand how this category is used in China, um, how users approach, approach the category. So it's not just enough to look at a simple market research demand report. I think uh, to follow on what Sarah said, it's also about urbanization. China's created 250 cities with a million people or more over the last 25 years. Those cities represent subcultures to reinforce what Sarah's talking about. So geography means something along with culture. And plus wealth creation, the speed by which the Chinese uh, family has acquired wealth changes everything extremely rapidly. And finally, the amount of data that has been produced on big data, some would estimate that's been produced, 90% of that is produced in the last 18 months. So those factors really combine to make China a discovery process that is almost infinite. I would add to what both um, has been mentioned in that China, in many ways, you could almost think of it as a wide range of smaller economies. Some of the economies more reflective of what we see in the U.S., others more reflective of other uh, nations around the world. And so, certainly, with the different size of the economies of each province, there's also going to be different differences in culture, um, how legal issues are handled, um, even how the customer has an interest of what their aspirations are for the future. It really is a complicated market, isn't it? I mean, if you think, talking about China market is the size of almost entire Europe, the population is enormous, and then the changes it undergoes is also quite rapid. And for marketers to get a grip on the fast-changing situation, it is a tough job. Yeah, I think another example to build on, on Han Lin's point was that if you look at the food category, for instance, you have very distinct food cultures, north, south, east, west, um, eight Chinese cuisines, so. When we talk about market, 10 years ago, there were probably less than 100 million people that would be defined in the middle class. Today, it would certainly be over 300, and some would say even 500 million. And the industrial sector that a U.S. company comes into China for also makes a difference. For example, many of the agricultural companies that want to sell equipment, um, they're going to concentrate mostly in northern China. But that's in many ways the historical breadbasket of wheat and so forth. Likewise, if they're looking at consumer goods in major cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and so forth, where there's a, a growing uh, wealth in the population, that's better suited for these types of companies. So that industrial sector does make a difference. Mm. I agree with what you say, but from your experience, when a company is ready to enter the China market, what is the level of understanding of this market? I don't think you can generalize. I think if you look at large multinationals who spend enormous amounts of money to granularly analyze China, uh, you'd probably put them at the top of the list. But if we look at smaller companies, probably one of the one of the most common errors of judgment is that the reactions to their products or services will be the same, and that certainly is is very different. Yes, I, I would I would agree with that, Bob. Um, I think you, you cannot assume that the portfolio can wholesalely be put into China. And again, understanding how a category works in China. I think the big multinationals, of course, they have fine-tuned approaches to understanding the market. But um, the new arrival, perhaps the SME, they may, may need to take a little bit more time to do, to do that. And certainly from a financial services standpoint, the range of experience we see among our customers varies from very, very fluent to to very basic. For example, um, in the U.S., we take it for granted that you can use the dollar 
different types of transactions. But it tends to be a shock for a lot of U.S. companies when they come out here that the dollar and the local renminbi aren't really convertible, and there are different restrictions of how you move the money in and out of the country. In the past, many American companies entered China with the idea of they're missing out on a multi. Uh, latitude of um, of opportunities. What is the sentiment now towards like future outlook and opportunities? I I like to talk about the past a little bit. I think China's done three things that are really important: build infrastructure across the entire continent, build a an urbanization which is more than half of the population now live in cities, and therefore a middle class. Those three components are what drives multinational strategies. So, in recent years, I would say that the curtain has come up on China as a national marketplace. Prior to that, it was fragmented, it was regional, it was local. So, all roads lead to creating branding with technology and innovation. Those are the three things you hear, both from Chinese and American companies. I would say that.、Um, Companies are looking at China still with a sense of anticipation and、um, excitement about the growth opportunities that are here, and perhaps the big multinationals are addressing things somewhat differently now than in the past, in the sense that they are looking much further forward.、Um, the market is moving so rapidly, and it takes a while to develop product here. So you need to you need to get out a, out in front of that demand curve and do I do a lot of foresight research with clients, a lot of trend work to understand what's coming.、Mm. So are companies actually acting a, in a timely fashion and taking the right approaches、um, to to take up on these opportunities? I, I would add to、um, what's been talked about is that when you're looking at、um, opportunity, it's always relative against other opportunities. And certainly, the Chinese pie, the, eco the economy, it may be slowing down, but it's still considered faster growing than other parts of the world. In terms of of execution, I think the the aspect of that's. That's most difficult is to how do we gather information as Sarah and and Han has talked about, but I think there's one element that we need to mention, and that's e-commerce.、Um, e-commerce has developed so rapidly. Five seven years ago, that was not really existent in China. Today, it's over two trillion dollars of e-commerce trading. So, for many companies, you don't have to leave the U.S. to、um, address the China market. Mrs. Wong, my favorite person, will find you、um, if you've got products and services that are relevant to her lifestyle. Yes.、Um, in terms of、uh, the the rapidly the rapid evolution of this market, in terms of of technology and social media, I mean the major U.S. manufacturers and brands. They are monitoring 24/7. They have entire departments monitoring social media here. It's really quite impressive, and antici again, anticipating、um, how consumers are reacting to their products.、Mm. So, do do you think it's realistic to think that American companies can use just a couple of years and capture a large part of the market here? Is that a realistic anticipation? Depends how much you want to invest.、Mm -hmm. I think it's hard to generalize. I think the market as as Chinese travel. You know, I think the、uh, the United States, for example, has educated or involved in educating some three million Chinese people over the last twenty years. Today, there are two hundred thousand students in the United States today. So that interaction of understanding cultures is greater today. And I would argue that、uh, China has a greater understanding of America than the other way around. But the drivers to、um, to to growth and development are urbanization, and I think if you take a young couple in Shanghai or Beijing or Guangzhou, they're going to react in many ways in a very similar way to their counterparts in the U.S., Europe, and other parts of Asia. I would add that one of the key differences between China and the U.S. is that China does have the government more、um, interactive with economic planning. For example, the National Development and Reform Commission does take a look at industries and to see which are encouraged, accepted, and discouraged. And in some way, forms your opportunity in China will be shaped in how the government's view of a particular industry is. Yeah. Well, we all know that the Chinese consumers are one of the most tech-savvy consumers out there. So, how do you think American companies fare in understanding the social media landscape in China? 
I think it's a two-edged sword. I think that the, for those companies who think it's very, it's it's an opportunity to show off products. It's also an opportunity to get punished yes. very severely, mm -hmm. and there are some very dramatic examples of that. So just as Sarah and Han talk about uh, the 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 amount of data, um, companies really have to be careful for what they put out in the market because the Chinese consumer not only does she understand that product or he, but she'll react to it very, very quickly. Let's turn the table for a moment here. What are the advantages for American companies, American companies entering China from the outside? I think they have a lot of early examples to look toward as help, for instance. So a lot of the um, early multinationals that entered P&G, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, etc., they can look to them as examples of how they've approached things. Now, what about Geography, like what? What is the What are the advantages of American companies, uh, as opposed to you know Japanese companies or European or South American companies? Uh, I would add a comment in terms of financing. Uh, our usual company coming into China will need some form of lend, some form of borrowing. But you know, a lot of U.S. companies, when they enter in China, they might be considered a small and medium-sized enterprise. And local Chinese banks tend to favor larger enterprises, particularly state-owned enterprises. But if you're a U.S. company entering China, chances are a U.S. bank, because they have a relationship with you in the U.S., will look with favor to help support your growth in China. And that's a good perspective. I think U.S. Excuse me, U.S. companies also have one advantage. U, the U.S. economy evolved over a large landmass in a short period of time with one market. Japan, islands, countries, Korea, peninsular countries, and even European countries are still individual. So I think that distribution, supply chain management, and branding strategies are the heart and soul of U.S. companies. I guess I would, I would say, again, it comes back to categories. So if you, were, um, if you were looking to enter China now and you were a cosmetics manufacturer or a, a fashion manufacturer, I think you might be hard pressed competing against uh, Japanese and Korean companies who tend to have an advantage because ch the Chinese look toward Japan and Korea around beauty. Mm, that's true. That's true. Yeah, it does go, uh, it does vary from industry to industry. Yes. Yeah. Well, finally, do you want to share your insights and thoughts on some good examples of how American companies do get China? Uh, I'll have to caveat my comments. Um, I'm an ex png -er, so in the early days of my China experience, I worked at PNG China. But to me, today, they still are at the head of the pack. Um, number one in skincare with Olay, number one in detergent, Tide, my own baby, um, number one in shampoo, Rejoice, and also Gillette. And I guess if you look to Gillette as an interesting case study for um, social media, the, um, the fact of the market is that 70% of people were dry shaving in China. And they came in with Gillette and said, how are we going to get people to wet shave? And they did some uh, consumer product in use research, some cultural research, and found out that Chinese women find men who wet shave sexier. And they brought this to life in a video they, they brought their research to life in a video and shared it. Uh, it went viral. It's turned into a meme with people uh, imitating the shaving scene, filming, filming their significant other shaving. I think it's been pretty, pretty, pretty well received. Yeah. Any other examples to share? I'd like to, we've been talking mostly about products. We don't talk about services. You know, the service sector has overtaken manufacturing as a percentage of GDP in China. That's happened very recently. But if you look at McDonald's and KFC as a service culture projected over all of the complexities we talked about to a high degree of success, I think that instinctively is a part of American culture. And the other one is automotive. Um, to think that GM and Ford could become really household names in against the backdrop of competition from Germany and Japan. That's a remarkable story as well. And I would give my vote to a company in the Midwest called A.O. Smith that makes water heaters. Now, as a U.S. citizen, when you think about purchasing homes, you don't think about which water heater you're going to buy. But in China, it's very much a consumer brand. And what A.O. Smith has done very well is really pinpointing to the aspirations of China's middle class to provide a good home with a good family and to make sure that everyone has warm water when they need it. 
And Great who, example. But who would yeah. ever forget Kohler could brand a bathtub and a toilet uh, better than anybody else in the world? No one ever thought that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of surprises, right? <laughs> Great. Well, Bob, Sarah, and Han, thank you for being on Thoughtful China today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Youku, Tudo, and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo, WeChat, and Twitter, and join our LinkedIn group. See you again.